Okay, let's slide into the three o'clock hour with Honeypot Boo Boo, Better Breach Detection with Deception Inception by Justin Varner. Justin, you can take it over. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate everyone being here. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you all about a new way of looking at breach detection uh, through deception inception, which is a lot of wordsmithing, but I'll get to what all that means as we work through the presentation. A little bit about myself. I'm a Thinks Canary authorized partner. So Thinks Canary is a company based in Cape Town, South Africa. They've been working on this platform and this product for about seven years. I believe so much in it that I'm willing to talk on their behalf. I'm not actually a Thinks Canary employee, uh, but I represent them at these talks and um, various events. Uh, I'm kind of hard to find in general, but you can locate me on Twitter and feel free to drop any questions in the Q&A as we move along. And I'm happy to answer some stuff on Discord as well. So with that, let's kick things off. So it helps to first define what a honeypot is or honey trap. So a honey trap really can be a honeypot and a, or honey token. And I'll talk about what these mean uh, further along. And these are really security mechanisms designed to entice adversaries to make mistakes and tell you that they're in your network and that they're up to no good. This is a component of a larger discipline known as deception technology. The great thing about deception technology is the better at being a trickster you are, uh, the more success you'll have in thwarting your adversaries. And the whole idea of honey traps is we want to produce higher fidelity alerts, less of a volume, because we only want to know at that point in time when we've been breached. We don't want to know hundreds of days in the future and, you know, after untold damage has been done. The reason we need this ultimately is because we need to lower our mean time to detect incidents as well as remediate. We need to ensure that incidents don't become complete catastrophes, which is what the current kind of model um, has led to. And we need to help our security analysts um, because if you look at laundry room Viking, or in this case, this is a metaphor for the deluge of problems that security analysts have to deal with. And I feel for them, you know, the at the current rate, they're going to be looking at tickets and triaging and sounds like a great idea on paper, uh, but ultimately it's not sustainable. You know, there's there's too much burnout in the industry. There are too many analysts that end up uh, leaving security. They get burned out. You know, we need to help them in whatever way we can. We need to arm them with the tools and the resources to be more effective ultimately. So let's talk about deception technology and why this is a solution to, you know, um, a new way and a new paradigm shift in uh, how, how we look at breaches. Well, if you just look at the past 10 years, going back to Snowden with the NSA, you know, all the surveillance and monitoring and of the greatest spy agency in the world, the NSA wasn't helpful at all. You know, he managed to rummage through the crown jewels and run off with you know, tons of tons of data, and they were none the wiser. And then if you start looking through from 2013 on, breach after breach, you can go back to solar winds. You know, I tell people we all, a lot of us still have a case of post-traumatic solar winds disorder because everything now that we do is centered around third-party risk supply chain. You know, we're only as secure as our weakest um, vendor. And so that's the effects are still being felt today, you know, years later. And then if you even look back to last year with um, colonial pipelines, that was a pretty startling situation because that was a convergence of physical and digital where pipelines are actually shut down and that caused delay to fuel um, stations, you know, on the East Coast of the United States. And that has very real world effects. So clearly what we're doing isn't working and we need a new model that's focused around deception, putting high fidelity, low volume alerts in the hands of our analysts so that we can stop breaches in real time. 
And if you really want to look at what the financial impact is, you, you need to only go back to uh, our friend Jimmy McMillan, who ran for president in 2012. His whole campaign was built on the idea of the price of rent being too damn high. And while he was right, the price of cybercrime is even higher. There was an estimate that it cost the global economy $6 trillion in 2021 and estimated it cost $10.5 trillion in 2025, which is obscene. About every 39 seconds, a business is breached. And in 2021, there were roughly 847,000 cyber complaints filed with the FBI. And up until now, there wasn't a solution, but I hope to provide one here to you today. And another alarming statistic, in addition to the cost, is the amount of time. So the mean time to detection based off the IBM threat report was 212 days. And in that amount of time, it allows for some obscenely large breaches to occur. And if you look at some of the largest breaches of all time based off the number of records, you can go back to 2020 with CAM4, which was a naughty streaming site. Uh, and there was some almost 11 billion accounts, which is interesting because there's only seven and a half billion humans on, on planet Earth, which tells you there were multiple people that didn't want to be known that they had this uh, service. But you can go back to Yahoo. You know, most people had Yahoo sports or fantasy or finance. They got breached multiple times, 3 billion accounts, which is also an insane, insane amount of records. And, and then you can go to 2018, A-D-H-A-A-R. That was India's attempt to do digital identity. And they wanted to place everything in kind of one identification system. So your driver's license, your retirement, uh, you know, your banking. And the problem is you don't want to advertise to hackers to come, you know, breach the system and prove that it's uh, unhackable because it took about two hours before, um, you know, every citizen in India was affected. So it's too long and it's it's too too widespread with the impact at their current rate. So now I want to talk to you more about, you know, Canary and this whole idea of Canary in a code mine or coal mine. Uh, what's neat with Canaries is they can be deployed in kind of any number of manners and they manifest in two forms. So you've got your canary birds. These are your honeypots as you traditionally know them. And a honeypot can be any device or system that appears to be legitimate running real services. And they can be anything from a smart fridge to a dumb coffee machine or anything in between. You've also got canary tokens and these are associated traditionally with honey tokens and these can be anything from aws keys that you drop on people's machines google documents pdf files qr codes i'm going to go through an example of every type of token in the subsequent slides to show you how you may want to deploy this and these are just some ideas again back to the original idea of deception technology creativity is the name of the game the more creative you are the more success you'll have at detecting breaches and we use these canaries as part of our early warning breach detection system. Rather than 212 days from now, we want to know, you know, 12 seconds from now that we're actually being breached so that we can mitigate the impact. And so let's first talk, talk about our canary birds. Now, a lot of enterprises that are over 10 years old rely on Windows and the enterprise. They rely specifically on Active Directory. Active Directory is a way to centrally manage users, machines, passwords, files, uh, and it runs on a series of what are called domain controllers. And these are very attractive to adversaries because if you can compromise a domain controller, in a lot of cases, you can take over the entire company. You can read emails, log into any machine, dump credentials, so on and so forth. So the idea here is we can create a bird or a device that looks, acts and chirps like a domain controller designed to learn an adversary. And so this is what a command would look like when you're running Nmap. Nmap is a classic port and service enumeration tool. And what I'm doing here in this command is I'm just doing an Nmap scan against common Windows domain controller ports that you would see. 
to show you how, how authentic these services actually look to an adversary that would try this. So if you go down um, a few lines, for example, to port 22, which is typically SSH, you can see the version, it thinks that it's Windows, like a real Windows domain controller. You can go down even to say port 80, and that's where you would normally see Windows Internet Information Services hosted. And if you were to navigate to this IP address at port 80, it would actually show you the IIS screen and it would ask you for credentials and it would capture them as well. And then you can even go down to, you start looking at the authentication pieces like 88 and 389. You can see here that you can actually customize your domain to be as realistic as possible and convincing as possible. So you see here, when I connect on 389, it says connected to domain 80.thanks.com. This could very easily be 80.besidesaustin.com or customized to your particular company and, and brand. And even though it's a terrible idea to run SQL Server a lot on domain controller, a lot of people do it. And so if you were to do that, it even tells you things down here. If you look at port 1433, it tells you the service build of, um, of SQL Server, the service pack, the version, everything. Like it's very convincing. You'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. And so this is what an adversary sees. And then this is what we see as defenders. You don't need to let it grow in Christmas tree this year because right here you've got all kinds of alerts that are firing and lighting, lighting up uh, your dashboard. What's cool with Canary is not only do you get these alerts in your central um, console, you also get them in Slack or PagerDuty or SMS. You can send them to any number of third party endpoints and you can automate a lot of this with, for example, uh, a tool like Times, which is um, a really great uh, SOAR platform uh, that I highly recommend. But in any case, what happens when you scan is not only do you get a notification that there's been port enumeration, uh, but you also get any attempts to interrogate these services. So if somebody tries to log in over FTP, it captures the username and password. And similarly with you know MS SQL, which is what I show over here, or sorry, um, HTTP, you can see here, it's actually capturing in the alert on the right side, the username and the password. And it's also capturing the user agent. And we're gonna see here why this is important because over time, we're gonna be building this forensic trail with the idea of de-anonymizing the adversary. And so this is actually a great forensic tool in addition to a real-time breach detection system. And even if we internally don't have the tools to forensically determine an adversary will have so much data that we can pass off to a third party uh, provider to assist them that will be well on our way. And so this is what a new honeypot or bird looks like. But one of the problems with this, you might have guessed it for the technical people, this domain controller is so realistic that it may actually interact with your current environment. So I wanted to show you an example of a non Windows domain controller system in the event that you want to deploy another type of personality. And you can customize this any way you like, but here's an example of Joomla. And Joomla is a classic vulnerable content management system. It's a great target for adversaries because there's usually gonna be some issues with it. So you can deploy a canary bird running Joomla. You visit the site, it looks exactly like a unconfigured version of Joomla. There's username and password fields. And what happens is when the adversary enters username Foghorn, password Leghorn, as you see on the right side, it captures a bunch of information for us forensically, like I had mentioned. So you start to get stuff like the user agent. And this is really helpful because you can start to narrow this down. It's telling me I'm on a Mac. We know that. Okay. And I'm using Mozilla. Well, and I'm coming from Richmond. There's only so many of these Mac machines in Richmond running Mozilla and all this data actually is anonymous or not anonymously it's uploaded to services like the valve hardware index and Nvidia and so all this stuff is kind of out there and it, you can see how you can quickly start to de-anonymize the pool of um, potential um, you know people that this could be so I did also want to mention though so those are traditionally um, 
this is the new sorry this is the new type of like honeypot which is called a production honeypot where this is very applicable to you as an organization as a person but you can actually go back in time about 20 years to what honeypots used to look like and these used to just passively sit on the internet and collect intelligence and it wasn't necessarily interesting to you as an individual but it was interesting to figure out what was happening in the broader internet and you can actually use this to figure out what's what's happening if you're interested in traditional threat intelligence. There's a great service called Gray Noise, and what Gray Noise does is it does meta threat intelligence. And so what it does is it looks at things that it knows are deterministically scanning the internet, like Shodan or Recorded Future, or you have content delivery networks, Amazon IPs. It takes all that stuff. It says, don't worry about that. Let's focus on who may be targeting you individually. And so you can use that data in conjunction with your production honeypot data to get external threat intelligence mapped to internal intelligence. You can figure out things like, is there a larger threat campaign happening? You know, are these just Chinese botnets or is there a determined adversary from China targeting me as an individual? So I wanted to mention this because it's a great free service, great tool, and it really helps augment the capabilities of of, uh, of Canary. And there's also another integration natively built in called Run Zero. This is um, HD Moore started this company. He's the creator of Metasploit, Epic Legend in Austin. And this goes together with Canary, like Shaq and Broken Backwards. And if you don't believe me, just wait till the next slide. But what's great about this is you can create Canary alerts from your tokens. You can map the public IPs automatically to assets. And you can start to correlate assets with tags to figure out, hey, do you have a machine that's communicating over Tor? That's unusual. You should probably investigate that. Or do you have a um, device that has a log4j vulnerability that you didn't know about, and it's also firing alerts? Well, that's a probably a good indicator that you should investigate because these canary alerts are high fidelity. They're worth investigating in any case. And it automatically creates all the information you need tells you um, and enriches the content, as you can see. So you use Canary, Run Zero, goes together well. I mean, you just look back at Shaquille O'Neal, and here's a couple examples of him just destroying backboards. So they go together like spaghetti and meatball, trust me. Now that we've talked about birds, I'm going to start to dig into the tokens and all the tokens all the way down and give you an example, starting with the recon tokens, rest in peace, Chris Farley. So the first recon token is the domain name system token or deceived nosy strangers. If you wanna figure out when people are snooping around like Snoop Dogg, you can use these DNS tokens because all these are, are simple pointers. So you can create a DNS token and map it to what's called a dark network segment. And that's exactly what it sounds like. It's an area or a network that isn't typically used for anything. And so if you get an alert for someone trying to resolve a domain to an IP in that dark network, there's a good chance that they're um, snooping around, they're up to no good. And so we can have this fire an alert and automatically tell us that there's enumeration happening. One important point, if you can see underneath the dog with binoculars, there's an alert that says this random string of name.canarytokens.com if you pay for the service, you can customize this domain to be, you know, your actual brand domain to make it look as convincing as possible. Um, because you don't want to just tell an adversary, hey, I use deception technology. You should know that. Uh, but this is the free service that you can go to canarytokens.org. And one other imp um, important point. So this isn't going to tell me my IP or the I IP of an adversary. It will tell me the IP of the DNS server used to resolve the query. But even with that, you can see here, it knew that this result was coming from Richmond, where I'm located. And that's a great piece of forensic detail. Even though I don't know the IP of the host, I know that they resolve using a DNS server in Richmond. So that starts to narrow down the potential suspect or pool of uh, suspects. It's a great token and it can be used for other things too, like wrapping Linux processes, um, and so on and so forth. Now, 
I love this particular token. This is a web redirect token. This is probably my favorite recon token. And this is pretty simple. You create a C name or like a mapping, for example, um, thinks.io. When the adversary visits that site, it will quickly grab a bunch of information from the browser and then send them to another legitimate site. For example, this token maps to besides Austin. In the process, though, this is grabbing a ton of useful information. So if you see on the right side in the alert, um, I'm starting to get not only the user agent again, but if you look further down, it even tells me that I'm running a Mac M1. And that also further narrows down the pool because there aren't that many M1s out there, especially in Richmond because of supply chain issues. And so how many M1 Macs do you have in Richmond? Well, that's great information for a forensic company. What's also cool too, is you can see at the bottom, there's a map with a bunch of different um, red you know, um, indicators. There's a geo map created anytime this uh, alert fires. So why this is helpful, as you might imagine, is you can figure out if these alerts are part of a larger campaign or if they are random and there's not a bigger picture here to or narrative to start to construct. And that can help you in your, your threat intelligence and starting to figure out are you being targeted or is these just are these just scanners and bots just hitting hitting these tokens. So that's really useful forensic information. And I'd like to, oh, there's also another great token here that's worth mentioning. This is the clone website token. Uh, what's great about this is you can take this token, which generates like five lines of JavaScript. You can embed it and obfuscate it because you don't necessarily want an adversary to start inspecting your, your web pages and finding this code on there. But the idea is if your website is cloned and then it's redeployed on another domain, it'll automatically fire an alert. So you can start to figure out, okay, maybe there's a phishing campaign underway. You know, maybe there's there's no good reason why anyone would necessarily be copying, say, bsidesaustin.com and then redeploying on bsidesaustin.org, for example. And so that could be indicative of a of a larger um, campaign. And so you're gonna grab a lot of useful information here. And again, you can see the, the different alert types. You have your console, you've got Slack down here. Um, PagerDuty, Jira, any number of endpoints so that you're immediately alerted when uh, when things are awry. Okay, I talked about recon. We can focus now on the application programming interface tokens, or Bert Macklin would tell you alert, protect, investigate, and he knows what's up. Let's talk about some API specific tokens. These are the first is that I love, this is probably my favorite token of all, is the Amazon Web Services token. And you can create actual AWS keys and you can automate deployment on endpoints automatically. So you could deploy them every single machine in your enterprise on your Macs, your Windows. And the idea is you create a unique memo and make sure one important thing about these tokens, when you create a token, don't just say test or this is a token. You want this to be descriptive because you want people to know uh, or you want to know exactly where this token is and when it's firing and, and what's happening here. And so use a unique memo. There's like a, uh, a script on the GitHub Canary uh, Utilities uh, page where you can actually um, generate this. But this is a very high fidelity signal. And a lot of times what happens is adversaries, they might grab these AWS keys from Susie Q's laptop in marketing, but they're not going to use them on her machine. They're going to take them and mistakenly use them on their own machine. And in the process, they're going to reveal a bunch of information like the command they ran. It actually tells you list buckets in addition to my IP and you know my geolocation. You're starting to build more and more of a constructing of a forensic trail. This is really helpful. And they might think they're the king of the castle, but king of the cloud, but they're not. And then similarly, there's another type of Amazon uh, token here, simple storage service. It's raw bucket storage. It's been around forever. People have inadvertently put sensitive information on buckets before Amazon opted you in you know, to security. 
And so this became an attractive target for adversaries. And so what you can do is you can create an entire token bucket that's illegitimate. And when something is interact when it's interacted with, even if it's just a list buckets or you want to, you know, for example, when you get a set of AWS keys, you want to typically know what buckets exist. And just listing those buckets will fire an alert and it'll in the process grab the user agent. So it knows here that I'm running this on the Linux AWS SDK Boto 3. So that's another piece of information. I was actually running this within uh, Mac on my M1, but you know, th this helps to capture user agent. It also tells you the exact type of requests and the URI. So if you try to locate something within the bucket, say, here's the bucket slash data, it would tell you exactly what your um, uniform resource indicator it went to and, and the user account associated with it. So you can see here, you can actually create token credentials like AWS keys and map them to token buckets and start to build this detailed forensic trail, which is really helpful. There's a lot going on in this slide, so just take it all in. But one of the one of the tokens that I love here is the Slack token because you can get super meta with this, and you can drop Slack tokens in public Slack channels so that people that come in try to read your Slacks and they slip and they should go back to MySpace or something like that. But you can see here when you run a curl command with the token, the bogus token. You know, all it tells you is missing scope, doesn't have permissions, whatever, but it fires an alert and it immediately tells you someone's snooping around. You know, oftentimes, or nowadays, I would say Slack is becoming the epicenter of business. If you can get access to a Slack tenant, uh, that's invaluably more, in, you know, important than email because so much of business runs through Slack or Teams and whatnot. So we can use these, this to our advantage and know that adversaries, when they get access to Slack, are gonna start enumerating through and they're gonna be looking for certain strings like Slack tokens. And we can give them a stone cold stunner. And then there's another API token. This is the most recent um, or re relatively recent one. It came out in October of uh, 2021. This is for Kubernetes, also known as K8. Because if you notice, there's K8 letters S, get it, K8s. And Kubernetes is a platform for managing like hundreds and thousands of container containerized applications. And what's a container? You guessed it, it's a self-contained application environment, independent of operating system hardware. It just runs Docker is an example of um, you know, a container um, platform and so on. And we can drop in a similar way to these AWS keys, we can create Kubernetes config files, which are very attractive can drop them on every single laptop. And when this Kubernetes config files access, it'll, it'll tell us um, the actual user agent run. Again, this is really helpful to help narrow down the trail of potential suspects. If we notice here that they're running it from an M1 Mac, uh, kubectl, which is like the Kubernetes um, command line tool. Again, that starts to build a forensic trail for us and tells me well, in this case, I was using a VPN IP, but normally it would tell me the IP, uh, the region, the city, all of these things, even if you like to know if it's a Tor exit node. Again, this is helpful for trying to figure out if your machines might be compromised. That's another great API token. And then the most recent one is really helpful. If you have Windows machines in your environment, I highly recommend that you check out the suspicious command token. And what this allows you to do is wrap any Windows command uh, in a token. So for example, who am I or netstat or any number of commands that you wouldn't typically see executed on say a sales machine, you can token this. So if um, you know, Jim Lay's machine gets compromised and somebody starts running, who am I? Oh, you're gonna fire an alert because Jim Lay would never do that, um, yeah, for example. And so, this is great and you can bet it in, in the registry. So it's nearly impossible to just know that these commands are token unless you're investigating the registry, but you guessed it, you can also wrap regedit in there. And so you can token the process in which to read the registry. And the idea here with any of these tokens 
is we're building layers and layers of tokens, building a web of deception, you know, deception, inception. The more tokens you lay, the higher likelihood an adversary is going to trip over one and then another and another and so on and so forth. Okay, so now that I've talked about API tokens, I want to talk about specifically mobile tokens or tokens here that you can actually put on your own mobile device. And I highly recommend you do because these are really helpful to know if your phone's been compromised. For example, there's a token for WireGuard. WireGuard is a newer VPN protocol that's kind of come along to supplant OpenVPN. And you can use their WireGuard VPN token uh, as an indicator for when your phone might be compromised. If you look at what happened last year with Pegasus uh, from the NSO group, this really insidious spyware that got on people's um, phones and they didn't even know it unless you did deep forensics. You know, how would you know if your iPhone got iPhone? Well, one of the ways that you can do this is you create this WireGuard VPN token and use an attractive name like uh, Enterprise VPN or Production VPN. And if an adversary gets on your phone, starts rummaging around and activates that VPN, it's going to fire an alert. And you know that you wouldn't do it because it's a bogus VPN. So this gives you a pretty clear high fidelity signal that your phone's been compromised, in which case you can toss it, get yourself a rotary phone, or at the very least start doing some forensics and figure out just, you know, how bad things are. So I highly recommend this. You can go create your own uh, right now, you know, canaryhookins.org. And feel free to scan this with your own mobile phone or not. It's not a trap, but um, you can use QR codes um, as tokens. And these are really helpful uh, because a lot of, um, you know, adversaries that are you just kind of snooping around, like maybe they're in the office and they're looking for guest Wi-Fi and you put out a code that says, you know, guest Wi-Fi, scan this code, but you don't actually use guest Wi-Fi. Or if you do, you push it out securely using some kind of endpoint management tool like Jam. Well, when the moment they scan it, you can do things like Rick roll them. You can send them to any number of sites or put them in a loop. Uh, and completely confuse and and um, and frustrate them. Uh, there's another great use case for these tokens. If you drop them in every single um, mailbox, and there's actually like a Gmail token and an Office 365 token to do this, you can sort of uh, subtly drop these tokens, make them unread, and if an adversary comes across a message that says Octa device enrollment code, Duo device enrollment code, or so on. They'll open this up, they'll scan with their phone, boom, fires an alert. You're going to know pretty quickly uh, that they're that they're up to no good. This is a great, and also if you're if you're curious and you don't want to scan it, if you scan this code, this just takes you to a randomized uh, URL and canary tokens with some movie quotes. So you can trust me or you cannot, but this is a great code. And now after this, if you look at this too long, by the way, you might hallucinate, but this at this point in the process, we are, if we're in toe-to-toe -to -toe with an adversary and we're engaging in psychological warfare, we want to let them know that we know that they're in our network. And so this is where it starts to get really, um, really creative. And you could start to engage in all kinds of psychological warfare just to throw them off and and maybe shape the direction of their trajectory of where they're going in life. And I'll show you an example. So we can use databases, right? And what's cool about this is we can token a database. We could also put tokens inside the database, going back to the exhibit meme of, um, you know, layering in like stuff inside of stuff. You know, we could have like, this looks like a seemingly legitimate database. We could have in here a string of another token, like a DNS token or a URL, and then they could start hitting a bunch of tokens. But what's neat about this is when you create the database, any simple action like importing the database and running commands against it is going to fire the alert, and it's going to give us information about okay. And maybe maybe we want to embed a message that says, you know, we know that you're here. You should leave. You can get creative. You know, this is database example here is just a bunch of nonsense. But you could very easily use it to encode a message or send send something to the adversary to let them know that you're on for them. This is a really great uh, token. 
another one of my favorite tokens, you know, is the Google document or the Word doc or any kind of document. The idea here is to make conspiracy Keanu question his reality. And you could put something in the title or the heading like, hey, this is the um, this is the executive compensation plan or the earnings prospectus report or um, the FTX, uh, you know, fallout, whatever. Make it attractive so that when they open this, they or they want to open this document. But in the document, you could totally throw a curveball and you could drop in something about Operation Northwoods or MK Ultra, something that may actually educate them to the point where they reconsider um, a career in petty um, cybercrime and being a scumbag and, you know, trying to compromise your, your network in the first place. You can get super creative here. And again, you can embed tokens within tokens. You might just lead them down a path of, of reconciliation. So there's a lot of potential here. And similar to Google Docs, you can spread some bullshits or, bull, or sorry, you can spread some spreadsheets, be it Google spreadsheets or Microsoft or whatnot. And if there's any other DB Cooper fans out there, message me uh, because we should talk. This is a really fascinating unsolved case, the only successful skyjacking in American history. And we can use this intriguing bit of information to lure in our adversaries and maybe educate them about it. Um, you know, there's, but it doesn't have to be anything. This can be complete nonsense at, or it can be something meaningful. In this case, every single field maps to some particular um, known fact about this case, like the, like D.B. Cooper jumped out of a airplane with 200 grand. He may be alive, he may not be, but $100 million, that's probably enough to convince a, um, an adversary to stop, um, you know, trying to opportunistically scam people. You never know could lead them down a path of, uh, of uh, you know, of a whole new career. And now that we know a lot of these tokens and birds, let's talk about the ultimate sort of subtitle in this and how you're gonna layer together your multiple, multiple levels of deception to create inception. And here's, a, here's one example out of a zillion, and this is where the creativity comes in. Let's say you've got an adversary, he pops a web server, and this web server could be a bird, or it could be a regular system that has like canary tokens running on it. So let's just say it is a bird. Well, that's gonna fire an alert, and it's gonna go to your Liam Neeson. It's, see, that's funny because Liam Neeson, and then security incident event management. Okay, if you're, if you're a security nerd, you get this. But that first alert is gonna fire a full log file to your sim and this is a good opportunity to tell people that in no way am i advocating for breach detection or canary to replace your classical um preventative controls and your forensics controls you still should use a sim you still should use endpoint logging you still should get telemetry data and use something like lima charlie to ingest all of this but you also that's not an effective the sim is not effective for real-time breach detection and that's that's really the use case we're trying to solve here is we want to know exactly when we've been breached but we want a forensic trail and so a great way to do that is to send that to your sim and so this is how you do it you know you send your first alert let's say that we have actually tokened on the bird a process like netstat i kind of mentioned that earlier well netstat when you fire or when they run that stat sends another alert, builds the trail. Then maybe they start running NMAP because situational awareness usually necessitates using something like NMAP to do enumeration, figure out what systems are out there, ports and so on. I showed you earlier how useful the tool can be. Boom, fires another alert. Maybe NMAP, we have them lure them into a Windows machine that's also a bird. There happens to be a file server running on port 445. How convenient. That file server also happens to have a document. And that document, you've got AWS credentials, which give you access to an S3 bucket. Boom, boom, boom. All the while, you're building this trail. And you might not know who, know who they are, but you're going to have enough information to send to a third party to figure this out pretty, pretty conclusively. 
And so the more layers, the better, the more creativity, the better. This is a lot of fun. And this is an attempt for defenders to get back, you know, um, an attempt to, to have an idea of when their network has been compromised because this is a cat and mouse game, but I've seen four or five companies, you know, avoid catastrophic breaches. I've seen pen test companies fail within seven minutes. Red teams, like I believe in this sincerely, which is why I speak on behalf of Thinks Canary, because I have seen it personally make such a huge difference and save countless amounts of heartache, time, money, you name it. Um, and so that that is why I believe a lot in this and why you should continue to explore it. And so with that, I wanted to thank you all so much for, for being here. I really enjoyed delivering the talk and please send any questions my way or find me on Twitter or, or message me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. Great talk. Um, everyone, please uh, keep the conversation going over in the channel that's set aside uh, just for this talk in Discord. Um, we will take a break, and at the top of the hour, we will introduce you to the next speaker. Enjoy your break. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Bye-bye.